the early early ones were very very blocky, very very chunky, and uh, you know just I never really uh, studied design. I just slow. Actually, it wasn't until fairly recent in the past eight years maybe that I really started looking at knives, looking at what other knife makers were really doing, and thinking about what they did and really looking at it from a design perspective other than just it looks neat. I, I started thinking beyond the, the aesthetic and the, I was started looking more into the function. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 88 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, YouTube reviewers, anyone who loves knives. You have found the podcast if you are a knife aficionado, and we welcome you to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Bob, another uh, great interview show today, the weekend episode, talking with a, uh, a knife maker, Dirk Pinkerton. Yes, Dirk Pinkerton. You may know him from the nine designs he has working with Kaiser. He also has uh, two with Artisan, and he has a couple in the hoppers with both of those. He also has a thriving custom knife career. He makes fixed blade knives, very purpose-driven um, utility and self-defense knives. He had uh, a career before his knife-making career that was conducive to developing new knives and testing them out. So uh, it was very interesting to talk to him. I've been an admirer and owner of a few of his knives, and uh, I think his designs are very cool. It was great to talk to him. All right, we'll get to that interview in just a second. But first, I want to remind you about Thursday Night Knives is the live YouTube video show that Bob does. He has a special guest co-host with him every once in a while. Sometimes it's a solo show, but it's every Thursday night at 10 o'clock. You can watch live on YouTube or on the Knife Junkies Facebook page. So that's Thursday Night Knives live at 10 p.m. on Thursdays. And I have to say, it's not just me. Jim is behind the switcher and he works magic. He makes this show look like a legitimate news show and uh, heightens everything we talk about. So it looks pretty sweet. You got to check it out. No pressure, right? So if, I, <laughs> if somebody watches this coming Thursday and it looks awful, okay, I'll take the blame. It's my fault. It's Jim's fault. All right, but please do join us Thursday night, Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and on the Facebook page. And if you want to find the Facebook page, you can go to thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook, and the YouTube channel is thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. I'm here with custom knife maker and knife designer Dirk Pinkerton. Uh, you know Dirk from his nine designs with Kaiser. He's also uh, got two in the works with them. He's also got a couple of knives over at Artisan, one of which is blowing up the charts, the proponent. Comes in two sizes. Uh, and uh, his knives are designed with a purpose. Dirk, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I I have uh, one Pinkerton, and it's the Orion. And uh, when that came out, uh, I was on a little Tangram tear, and I saw that, and um, the blade shape just oh man, it won me right away. I'm a I'm a huge sucker for the Warncliffe style blade and that and that sort of sax look. That that's a theme that runs heavy in your work. Tell me about your design inspiration. Where does this come from? Oh, well. Everything I, I almost everything I do starts with a, a function. Um, I have something in mind um, when I'm designing it, and then I try to apply a shape to that to that function. So, like with uh, with the tangram, which follows on to the the, the Warncliffe, which I'm really a big fan of uh, for all kinds of work, not just uh, little cutting chores. I wanted to do something a little bit different than I've done before, and uh, I wanted to still keep a lot of that angular design that I that I do on a lot of my older work, um, and try and incorporate a little bit uh, of a different flow to it. And that's uh, that's kind of where everything goes. It, it starts with a, a purpose, and then I try to adapt a shape or something that that's in my head to that purpose. And yeah, you know. You're also influenced by history and things you've seen, um, 
and you mentioned the sax, and that's actually where my Warncliffe uh, affinity started. Uh, the Warncliffe, first one I ever made, the the Warning. Uh, I cut out the first one that I did back in about 2001, 2002, and I was trying to make a pocket size sax, and that's uh, that's basically where that really began and where my affinity for for the Warncliffe really got started. So where did your um, affinity for knives come from in the first place? I know you did some security work. Did it did it come out of that sort of necessity, the need for a good tool? Um, it came from my father. Um, my father always had a pocket knife with him, always, constantly. Didn't matter what day, time of the day it was, morning, noon, night. There was always, he always had something in his pocket. Um, and it ranged from an old case which I, I wish I had all those cases that he had now. Um, had I known, I would have kept each and every one of them, regardless of the condition. And he went through his uh, Spyderco phase, um, where he carried yeah. the little clippets. He loved those. Um, and he always had one with him. And I just, that's just where it got started. Um, just seeing him with it all the time and understanding that for him, it was a true tool. Uh, you know, not just a piece of pocket jewelry. Mm-hmm. He used it, abused it sharpened it and uh, it, it, he wore them down to nubs um, in his mind if he couldn't uh, if he couldn't use a knife to fix the problem then he would go and get the, the proper tool for it but the knife was always his first go-to tool and yeah they were always beat up and abused and it, I just something about that uh, stuck with me and as I got uh, got older I started carrying knives just because I didn't really have a purpose other than that he had one, so I wanted to carry one. And um, when I got into the security field, then I started noticing law enforcement, other security people had were carrying knives, and then I really started thinking about you know the, the purpose of a knife just beyond hey you know you cut your letters open with them or cut a piece of tape or something like that. And um, that's when I really started thinking about the the serious application of the knife as a tool beyond just uh, a, a simple cutting tool. You know, the, the self-defense applications, um, life-saving applications, and how it can be utilized in that regard. So when you first uh, kind of had that realization, uh, what, what were the first knives you were designing? What did they look like? Uh, bricks. <laughs> they look <laughs> like bricks. <laughs> um, I didn't really, uh, I didn't understand or uh, couldn't get what I had in my head onto a piece of paper. So the first ones, you know, I had all these great designs in my head, and when I drew them, they came out as very square and blocky, which I think may also kind of uh, be part of the reason why a lot of my designs are very angular, because I just never never went beyond, you know, I, I didn't go try and get away from that completely. I didn't look at it and say, oh, my God, this is hideous, because when mm-hmm. I made them, they were functional. They fit the hand and they felt good. They didn't look good, but they <laughs> they felt good. Right. And they did that work that you were looking for them to do. What kind of uh, blade shapes were you were you doing right then? Uh, the very first knife I made was uh, a drop point. Very broad blade. I think it was probably, it was almost two inches wide. Um, a very broad piece of 440C uh, that I, I can't even remember where I got the 440C. I cut it out, hacksaw. Did everything with a hacksaw and a file, hand filed the blade, uh, the bevels, everything, and uh, had a local heat treater do it. And I found a cheap, I'm trying to remember if that, I think it was a rubber handle, I can't remember for sure, uh, that I put on there. And um, yeah, that was the first knife I ever made. Did you carry it and use it? I did for a while. And uh, after I carried it for a while, used it. And I sat it down one night and looked at it, and I realized I could do a lot better than that. So I set it aside. And I, actually, I think I ended up giving it to a friend. Um, when I told him I wasn't carrying it anymore, he said, if you don't want it, I'll take it. And I just, okay, there you go. But yeah, the early early ones were very, very blocky, very, very chunky. And, uh, you know, just I never really uh, studied design. I just slow. Actually, it wasn't until fairly recent in the past eight years maybe that I really started looking at knives, looking at what other knife makers were really doing and thinking about what they did and really looking at it from a design perspective, other than just, it looks neat. I, I started thinking beyond the the aesthetic and the, I was started looking more into the function 
of, of the design and what they were doing and why they were doing it. So you're in, you were working in this field uh, when you first started making knives, you're working in a field where you have the opportunity to sort of field test it, see how this, how they carry uh, with other, I, I'm, I'm making assumptions about what you were doing. I know you were in private security in the corporate world. And uh, I assume that there was some place uh, for a knife on your belt or, or, or stashed somewhere. And uh, I would imagine that was a good opportunity to sort of test drive uh, some of the designs you were coming up with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, describe that process of how you, um, once you make a design, uh, how you sort of break it in, field test it, make, sh you know, make your tweaks and all of that. To that little bit of history, that the, the first knife I really did that with was a knife uh, that I called a variable broadhead. A buddy of mine, he was in uh, on the Columbus Police Force, and he was uh, very much a knife fanatic. He loved knives, and he loved neck knives. And he used to carry the uh, uh, Fred Perrin LeGriff. Um, loved the finger hole, loved the security, loved the size. But what he hated about it, carrying it as a neck knife, is if he got turned around or you know, wrestled around, the knife would get twisted, and he would go to reach for it it wouldn't always be where he wanted it to be. So he would grab it and the edge would be the wrong way. The handle would be the wrong mm -hmm. way, something to that effect. And he asked me to think about coming up with a better solution to that. So the variable broadhead was born. I started looking at what he wanted, his application of an edge on either side handle. So it's always where he wanted it. So a centrally located uh, handle, double edged dagger uh, blade, still the same finger hole. And uh, that was the first knife like that that I made and that I actually field tested at work. And so I carried it around for a while. Uh, being security, you don't get the chance to uh, you know wrestle with people as much as the police officer does. But um, mm -hmm. I would uh, I would put it through its paces when I was uh, you, know, you know out on a, a tour or something. Um, I would run the stairwells, you know, run through the building, do things that would caused me to uh, to move around quite a bit and see what it did and how it felt. Then I also carried it in my pocket, see how it felt there for size, if it was too heavy, uh, because he also mentioned he wanted to be able to do that. And uh, that was one of the early test runs that I did on a knife um, and at work. And then um, when I, come, when I uh, do something a little more utility-oriented, the first thing I do is it, it's got to feel, you know, I make the knife, do the prototype. I check it, how it feels in the hand. I mean, I don't do any serious cutting or anything with it. I just hold on to it, make the sheath, carry it for a while, draw it just to see how it feels. I, I'm not worried about its performance at that point. I want to make sure it fits the hand correctly and it feels right in the hand. So I'll move it around, draw it in different uh, different methods, different directions, um, carry it different ways. And then once I'm satisfied, I've got the handle laid out the way I like, then I'll start testing the cutting performance. Um, mainly because with a, a knife blade, you always want, to, want it to cut correctly. Um, you always want it to be a good cutter because that's its primary task. But mm -hmm. you're dealing with, for me, I do a lot of my heat treat goes to, it goes to Peter's heat treating. So I'm 100% confident in what they do. So I know if I tell them what spec I want, it's going to come back. It'll perform. I know, I know the heat treat will allow it to perform. The only question is, did I put a good enough edge on it? Mm -hmm. uh, so when I do cutting t uh, tests or something like that, it, it usually comes down to a completely new blade shape. And that's when I'll really put it through some kind of a cutting test. Um, if it's a bigger blade, chop some wood. Smaller blades, though, are usually cutting into um, water bottles, stacks of paper, see what kind of penetration I get, see how much cut I get to make sure those are clean cuts, not jagged tears, uh, see how it feels when it penetrates a soft material. Um, I have done a little bit of cutting with meat, not much. Um, that gets a little expensive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, those are the kinds of things that I'll do when I test out a new design and uh, just to see how it works, see how it performs. So this variable broadhead, just just to uh, reiterate to to listeners, this it looks like a modern day arrowhead kind of uh, dagger uh, with a hole kind of at the base in the ricasso, and then it's got a symmetrical handle usually, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, uh, and uh, with a little bit of micarta or G10 or something on there 
to give you grip. And uh, unlike the Legriff, there's uh, it's it's totally new, neutral indexing, if you will. Either way you grab it, it's going to be. It looks like it's going to be exactly the same. Now I've never held it, uh, but but just to look at it. Yes, absolutely. When you were testing this, were you testing it as a neck knife? I know you said you put it in your pocket uh, to try that as well. Yeah, I but... tested it as a neck knife. I mm-hmm. tested it, uh, dropped it in all my pockets to see how it would ride, uh, see how you could draw. Um, and then also I started, I put it on the belt, clip it on the belt inside the waistband, outside the waistband to see where it felt optimal for me. Um, everybody else has, you know, everybody has their own preference on how they use a knife, but you know, I would, uh, test it out to see where it felt the best for me as a neck knife. Um, uh, I found that I, I'm actually very sensitive to wearing, uh, neck knives. I can't wear much weight around my neck, so mm-hmm. I don't wear neck knives at all. Uh, so it was, that was a non-starter after a while once I realized that. And then I start actually, uh, the variable broadhead I'll wear on my belt in a horizontal position, uh, on the center line, right in front. That way I can grab left or right handed. If I grab right handed the way I have it set up, it comes out in reverse grip. I grab left handed, it comes out in forward grip. And that's, that's the idea of it. No matter how you grip it, as as long as you get your finger in there, you're going to pull it out. You're going to have a blade in your hand, secure usable. Okay. So I I want to, I want to go from one extreme to another. That is a small featherweight, 100% purpose driven little knife. And, and, uh, and now, uh, you are known hugely for the proponent from artisan, which is a giant, (laughs) it's sort of the opposite. It's a giant, heavy, beautiful, uh, Warncliffe, uh, man, I, I think it is, I think it's such a cool looking knife. Thank you. Uh, haven't, you're welcome. I have not gotten my hands on it, but it is very much up my alley in the, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm a sucker for, for pretty much, you know, how, how you define that knife, big, chunky titanium, um, uh, Warncliffe. Yeah. Tell me about that knife, the development, uh, explain how that came about and, and how, how it was working with Artisan Cutlery. Uh, Artisan was fantastic, extremely easy to work with, um, great communication. I love working with them, very uh, very open. They listen to whatever I have to say. It's, uh, it's never a question of, you know, uh, is it something that we can do, or it's just a question of when can we get to it? Um, because that, as you've noticed, they're, they're exploding, uh, becoming mm-hmm. extremely popular. Uh, the design for that actually came around. Um, I had basically four models of the, uh, the warning that I do, uh, Mark one through Mark four. And when I sent drawings to uh, artisan to look at, um, they selected the Mark three, which if you take a Mark three warning, you lay it right on top of the proponent. It's exact. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's the perfect silhouette of that. And, um, they said, okay, let's, let's do a folder. Okay, fine. I gave my, you know, that's fine. I hear my basic drawings on a folder I had in mind. So what they did was, uh, what I liked is this was actually one of the, this is a true collaboration effort. Um, cause a lot of times a designer will send a, a company a knife and, or a design and the, the company will make that design. Mm-hmm. Well, I got an email back with some drawings and it was, Hey, here's our, uh, here's a sketch we did. We incorporated a couple of ideas. What do you think? I looked at it and they added, you know, what I would assume a normal, you know, any company would, they put their, uh, pivots on there, their screws. That's, you know, that was expected, but I saw some of the, the cutouts in the handle, which I don't do that. I mean, that's, that's not my thing, but when I saw it, I was like that, that really works on that knife. I like that. But I'm sorry, but before you go on about what you tweaked, you talk about the finger grooves kind of on the side. It, it almost looks like they're there for, for finger purchase yeah, on the, abs- on the yeah, bottom actually, dorsal. Uh, because of the thickness, um, I have small hands. And, um, you know, when I saw that, my initial thought, I wasn't expecting it to be thick. Um, like I just saw it in profile, but I liked the look. Uh, so I basically repositioned them a little bit to where I thought it would be more uh comfortable for the finger mm-hmm. and changed a little bit of the, uh, the dimension of the groove. So there would be a little more, it looked a little more balanced to me. And, um, the next thing I know, I get another drawing with it in 3d and I looked at how big it was and 
I kind of like, kind of like, do you, you know, do you really want it to be this big? And like, oh yeah, it's like, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah, I wanted because a lot of my uh, warnings are thick blades, are heavy, hefty blades. I, do, I like to do that a lot. And I was like, that's fantastic. Let's roll with this. And uh, not too long after that, I got a prototype, and I did not realize. I mean, it blew me away. I was like, this is perfect. This is actually, this is perfect. It fits into at the time when we started the pro, uh, the program, it fit into where everybody was really going with uh, folders, you know, big, mm-hmm. solid, chunky knives. And um, I think it had that that chunky look, but still had just enough. I don't want to call it elegance, but uh, that's that's about the only word that comes to my mind. It's got a lot of design flourishes. Uh, it's got that beautiful yeah. fuller, the oversized. Uh, thumb lugs which are are really cool looking uh it's got the uh, uh you know the milling in the handle that you're talking about yeah. and uh yeah i mean i think it's a i think it's got a lot to it other than uh it just being a big giant knife yes definitely I, that's it nailed, i mean they nailed it absolutely what i was hoping for and the what i liked was uh the stop pin that was not my idea. I would love to take credit for it. I'd love to say it was my idea, but that was actually Artisan's Just idea. Describe that stop pin. Well, um, when you look at the uh, handle of the knife, you'll see a hole down by the finger notch uh, towards just below the pivot. So when you open the knife, the tang goes, uh, has a hole in it that matches. And on one side of the, the other side of the frame, there's threading. In the box with the knife is a pin that fits precisely in that hole you put the threaded in end of the pin in screw it down tight and you now have a fixed blade knife uh so it's it's a it's a convertible knife um, right a, a fully mechanical connection there making it rigidly absolutely fixed yeah yep and uh, yeah i mean i I, as soon as I saw the drawing with it, I'm like, this is cool. I've thought about it in the back of my head off and on over the years, but never really tried to apply it. And it it kind of takes it over the macho edge. You know what I yep. mean? It sort of adds – because it's already a pretty muscular knife. And then you add add that and, and you're 100% committed to its muscularity, if you know what yep. I mean. You know, you're – you know, you think this is a beefy folder? Well, check it out. It's yep. actually a fixed blade. <laughs> so, yeah, that's – it's it just blew me away when they they put that finishing touch on it. So there's a smaller version of that. Is that same finishing touch on that smaller version? It is. It is absolutely. And the uh, the smaller one I like because it's it fits my it fits my hand perfectly. Um, it is just the exact size for my hand. It's still very very strong. Um, it's still going to do. It's going to handle the same kind of abuse. Uh, it's just because of the size, you're just not going to be able to put it in the same situations because you're not going to be able to, you know, hit it with a, a log to baton through something just because of the size. But it would handle it without any issues. So it's to me, it's the perfect heavy use everyday carry knife. Well, so I want to talk about a couple of other designs. Um, uh, the Escort. I always loved the Escort. I think that's a beautiful knife. Uh, which I'm not sure if you if you if that was a custom knife before it was a Kaiser knife, um, uh, and the Lancer I think is is beautiful. That w- that's a fixed blade knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that was a, a custom knife that Kaiser is making. Uh, this past year you had the Fire Ant come out. You've you've had a number of you have nine knives with Kaiser and I guess two in development. Yes. Uh, so uh, what do you have in development and and what's it like working with Kaiser? Kaiser is another great company to work with. Um, they are, you know, they're very responsive. They um, are very, very open about the process on how they do things. Communication is great. Um, you know, if I have a question, I get an answer almost immediately. So, yeah, it's it's another fantastic company to work with. Uh, I have nothing but highest respect for, for Kaiser. Uh, the, I guess the downside is you, you know, it's great when you get in early with them. But uh, once they start getting popular and they start growing, that's the only bog down from my perspective as an individual dealing with the company is I'm no longer the only, you know, one of the only people they deal with. Now I have to, you know, wait in line, uh, which I do not begrudge them that success at all. I'm just very happy they have that success. Uh, But sometimes when I have a great idea or I want to talk about something and I, okay, 
you know, I sent him an email and, you know, reach out to him. I was like, okay, um, give us a couple of days and we'll get back to you on that. We, you know, we've got a meeting coming up and, uh, but again, that's just, you know, that's the cost of doing business and I have no issues with it, uh, cause that means they are successful and they are growing and that's uh, only good news. So what do you have? Well, what's in the offing with Kaiser? Uh, you've got two and develop. One's called the inversion. Yes. Is that right? The inversion. It is a, uh, it's a uh, folding version of a uh, knife I do called the Smilodon, which is uh, a Pakal style reverse grip knife. It's a short offset blade uh, on a, I don't know the other word for it is basically the, the handle shape actually originated from the Lancer that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I trimmed it down, changed some of the, uh, the angles on it to, to be more uh, diminutive and easy to carry. Uh, and fit the hand in a reverse grip much more uh, comfortably. And Smilodon came from a lot of, if you don't know what it is, that's the, basically the scientific name for the saber-toothed tiger. Uh, oh. So the, the blade reminded me of the saber-toothed tiger tooth, the big tooth. So that fixed blade version was the inspiration for the, the inversion. Um, there have been, Spyderco did the Pakal not too long ago with South Narc, and uh, I know there is another uh, reverse grip folder out there, custom. Uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name that makes them slipping my mind right now. But I wanted to do my version of it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's a market that is growing in popularity. The you know the reverse grip self defense pakal mm-hmm. uh, movement. People that practice that, and I just threw it out there. Uh, I had the had it all drawn up, and I said, "Hey, you know, what do you think about this?" And it's actually been sitting there for a little while in the works. And as soon as they saw it, they said, "Yep, we'll do it." Uh, they were looking for something different, and they have, nobody presented anything like that to them. So they jumped on it right away. So uh, we talked about that. Uh, well, at least the prototype we saw on Knife News uh, on this podcast uh, in an earlier episode, and. Uh, the version I saw of it had a beautifully terraced handle um, and, uh, you know, kind of topographical looking, which was cool. And just seeing the blade coming out kind of in reverse orientation to what we're used to seeing from a handle shaped like that. I was like, wait, what? what? <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> you know, because uh, I, I like the Pakal style of knife. I don't I don't have any, but, uh, um, you know, I've. I've practiced a bit of Kali through the, through the years. And I love that Pical style of practicing, you know, I've never gone out and uh, gone out and gotten in a knife fight for real, but, <laughs> but, you know, turning edge in and, and doing, you know, doing that kind of reverse grip drilling is, is really fun. And uh, I think, I think you're right. I think there needs to be more, not there need to be more knives set up like that. And the Smilodon was a knife I was going to bring up because um, first of all, I, it's really a beautiful knife, and um, it's just uh, so sinister looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I, I, I kind of want it to be a little sinister looking. Um, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's actually an older design too. Um, I I don't remember the year, but wow, it's it's been a while. Um, I saw about wow, two thousand ten. Maybe 2010. I can't remember how far back it is now. But um, uh, when you first started seeing glimpses of reverse grip stuff, it was Keating did the draw had his draw point programs. Um, that's the first time I really got an introduction to it. And then uh, I saw uh, Rob Patton, knife maker, Flinch pick. Yeah, uh, did that and saw some of his stuff at the. Uh, at the blade show one year. And that really inspired me to start playing with that. And the actual first version of the Smilodon was a very much smaller clinch pick oriented size, uh, blade that actually was made from a piece of scrap, which, uh, I made, put it on uh, the table. Uh, when I used to uh, share a table with Daryl Ralph, uh, put that on the table and it was gone in a heartbeat. Uh, which you know, yeah. I just was blown away because I didn't think anybody was going to want it. And uh, that's when I started developing the Smilodon after that through various uh, blade angles, uh, um, orientation, how much the, the blade is offset, and how the blade handle felt with that uh, modified Lancer uh, handle 
because uh, I, I did start with the, the first full size when I started with a Lancer handle, just felt a little wrong. So I just kept trimming away and trimming away until I got to the, the final version of the Smilodon that you see today. So uh, when can we find out about uh, about the new Kaiser the in- uh, knife? I'm yeah, sorry, the inversion. The inversion. Yeah. Um, if everything stays on schedule, which with uh, what's going on in China right now, I don't know um, how they're mm-hmm. going to be impacted by that. Uh, we're looking at, they said March, end of March, they should start uh, shipping. So hopefully everything stays on course for that. Cannot wait to check that out. So you you mentioned Daryl Ralph. Uh, he came on this show. What a cool guy. What a, <laughs> great, a great guy. guy. And and I've I've uh, I've always been an admirer of his of his knives. Um, I guess I got the first glimpse of them earlier than than the Expendables. I guess when when he was doing stuff yeah. with Meyerco, which I know you have also. Uh, uh, I got wind of him then and then saw his stuff. So tell me about your relationship with Daryl Ralph. What does he mean to you as a knife he's, maker? Daryl's basically, uh, he's my mentor. Um, I won't, I can't call myself an apprentice, um, but he's, uh, he's my mentor in the knife world and good friend. We've been friends for, gosh, I think the first knife I, I bought my, one of my early customs I bought from him was 2000. And we live, I live 20 minutes away from it in, in Ohio. And that was kind of how the whole thing got started is I saw one of his knives. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was an EDC, an early EDC, bought the EDC and then sent him an email. Hey, can you make me another one? And I want to do this, this, and this. Yeah, we can do that. Not a problem. <laughs> he makes the knife and then he's like, yeah, it's ready. And I'm like, you know, Daryl seems kind of silly to ship at UPS when I'm only 20 minutes away. Why don't I just come over and pick it up? And <laughs> at first he was, he was pretty resistant to the idea. It's like, no, nah, I, I prefer not to have visitors. You know, it's a, it's a shop, you know, we work here. And I, I was like, I understand I'm not going to get in your way, but really it just, you know, I kept bugging him with it and finally was like, yeah, come on over. So one Saturday <laughs> morning I went over to pick up the knife. I got there, gosh, I think it was about nine 30 in the morning. And I was expecting to be in and out of there in a heartbeat. I didn't leave until almost nine o'clock that night. And wow. that, I mean, just hit it off. He just took me on a tour of the shop, explained how everything worked. And he started handing me, you know, hey, here's the Camilla CDC. And here's here's some stuff I'm doing with uh, over here. And I, we just became friends after that. And um, I would continually bug him to make my designs And he would ignore me and ignore me. And finally he said, you know, I have an idea. Why don't you just make your own knife? (laughs) He said, because these are my designs. This is what I make. You, you just go make your own knife. And, uh, so I said, okay, I will. And I would come back to him and how do you do this? How do you do this? You know, what am I doing wrong here? And, uh, the first knife I made with him was actually, uh, a very long, thin Warncliffe blade had a slight curve to it. I've still got it somewhere. Uh, But I brought it over and handed him the knife and he looked at it and he's like, okay, we're going to heat treat it. He asked me a couple of questions that I had no, I didn't know. He asked if it was annealed. I said, I don't know because it's not annealed. I can tell that. Said, so (laughs) this is what's going to happen. It's going to warp as soon as it comes out of heat treat. And it did. Uh, So he put it on his surface grinder plate with a magnet. So it would cool down and at least straighten out a little bit. And then as we get uh, get finished with that and it's cool, he looks at it. He then spent the next probably two hours uh, grinding the blade, straightening it up for me, and uh, which I thought was really cool because I wasn't expecting it at all. I mean that he just had the little uh, little horizontal nine inch uh, disc grinder, and that's how he did it. He didn't use a, a belt grinder at all, just that little disc grinder, oh, wow. and he just worked on it for a couple of hours till he got it right, and he was happy with it. And there you go. Here's your knife. I was like, I just can't believe I just sat here and watched this. <laughs> oh, wow. So did he teach you tricks about grinding and all of that all, yep. all the way along? It wasn't so much that he would uh, tell me what to do. He would basically wait for me to come back and tell him what my mistake was. Like, Daryl, uh, I keep getting, you know, I get a little facet here. What am I doing wrong? He said, well, okay. He would ask, what am I doing when I'm grinding? You know, like, well, I'm standing here. This is what I'm doing. And he was like, okay, the, you're, 
your position is a little off. So what you're doing is as you're moving across the belt, you're, you're turning your body and, you know, when you shouldn't be turning your body at this point, you should be moving the blade and you're trying to turn the body to, you know, it, all these little things. And he basically said, I can tell you these things. He said, but until you do them yourself and figure them out, like pretty much everybody else does, <laughs> he said, it's just going to be a lot of noise. Um, he said, cause you're going to hear what I say. You're not going to understand it. And then one of these times you're going to go, Daryl said this and you're going, Oh, that's what that is. And, that's exactly what it is. I mean, he's exactly right. That is learning and teaching in a nutshell right there. You know, uh, I find that with, uh, you know, I have young kids and, and, and I will go off on some lecture and think I'm really breaking through with all my, my <laughs> words. And then eventually I realize I'm just making sounds out of my mouth, you know, <laughs> I mean, as far as they're concerned. So what was the, uh, de describe what it was like going from making fixed blade knives to making folders? Well, I can't tell you what it's like to make a folder because I haven't made one yet. Uh, I still only do fixed blades. So really? I've, uh, haven't made a, made a folder, just design them. Man, because, uh, you're pretty adept at designing them. Thank I you. Say. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The, the fire ant, uh, so fire ant came out last year, 2019. Mm -hmm. I That's think, the Kaiser. official release. Yeah. Such a cool little EDC. It's like a three inch blade worn cliff. I think it's two, three inches, maybe even slightly 2. under seven, I think. If I remember correctly, yeah. two point seven. So when you're designing a knife like that, I mean, it. So you, on your website, knives designed with purpose, but the purposes are are different. You know, uh, um, you look at uh, you look at the proponent, and uh, it seems to have a different uh, use than the fire ant, which seems to have a different use from the lancer. Um, to me, I look at the lancer; that's all self defense all day. Same thing with the variable mm -hmm. broadhead, uh, but the proponent. You know, could straddles a lot of fences. Yes, you know, and and uh, the fire ant seems pure EDC. Do you just decide that you want to solve a problem and then you design a knife to solve it, or um, how does that work? Do you just does a knife just come out and then you decide this would be good for X application? Yeah, um, it's it's more along that lines. Every now and then I'll have a, a situation where I'll think of a a, a problem or a situation or a task and try and design a knife to that. But most of the time it's, I have a, uh, a shape pops into my head and then I think what it would apply to. And then I proceed from there. And, um, the fire ant actually started back 2014. Wait a minute. No, before that 2010, when I was uh, still with Myrco, they were built, they wanted to do uh, HTM knives which was a team up with Daryl Ralph and Mike Manrose. Uh, they wanted to do what was called hand tech made knives. The idea being uh, giving you the option of designing a knife and having it put together the way you wanted. Uh, so the, the early format was uh, the knives that they designed and had made. And then down the road, that was going to expand into the ability to customize it. Well, it never got there, mm -hmm. um, but the, the fire ant actually started out to be designed for HTM knives back then, and it was actually mm -hmm. a bigger knife. Uh, the original design was a three-and-a-half-inch blade, and uh, same, everything was the same. It was just a three-and-a-half-inch blade. Well, they uh, HTM took the knife and minimized it to the size you see that with Kaiser, and then they actually made a much, much bigger size, a five inch blade version of it. Mm. Uh, wow. And we did, uh, I think they made 10 of those. I still wish I had mine. <laughs> made made 10 oh. of them. I, I got to sell knives, so I sold it. Um, I got three yeah. of them and I sold them. But um, yeah, so there was a five inch version, the three and a half inch version, and then the smaller version. And by the time it was ready to, to get running, HTM folded. So uh, they're out there somewhere. They, the blanks, they actually, there are blanks from that knife run cut. Uh, I just uh, don't know exactly where they are. I'd love to get my hands on them. But I had the prototype of the uh, the small one, and it had been sitting around not doing anything. And I said, hey, here's a design I did with HTM years ago. They're long gone. Nobody has rights to it. It's my knife. You want to do it? And yeah. Uh, they fast-tracked that one. That one in, got done and released very fast. They really liked that one. 
It seems like there's a, a, a split between your custom work and your design work, design slash collaboration work, in that your design slash collaboration work seems, on the whole, um, and, and this, this will change, of course, with the inversion, uh, but it seems on the whole EDC oriented. Even the proponent, you know, it, it is a big, very extremely capable knife. Maybe not something, you know, and obviously could be used tactically, but it's not something, it's, it's not what I think of when I think primarily of a tactical knife. So it seems like, uh, you know, you have the Lancer, but aside from that, much of your collaboration stuff seems EDC. And then much of the knives you produce custom in your shop seem more oriented towards uh, self-defense and, um, you know, that, that kind of sort of weapon uh, application. Who, who are your users? Who, who buy your knives? And do you keep up with them? Do you know how, how they're, how they're being deployed, uh, how they're being used, I, this kind of thing? Uh, I definitely try to keep up with them. Um, don't always get feedback, which is a little bit of a bummer. But, uh, uh, yeah, I try to keep up with my customers as best as I can. On the custom side, the people that buy them are primarily people looking for a backup knife, uh, self-defense, um, something to go with their uh, concealed carry. Um, I have a lot of law enforcement, a lot of military uh, military drop has dropped off a little bit since uh, probably about five or six years ago. Uh, the demand for my stuff uh, over there has uh, dropped, just just a reduction in, in what's going on primarily. But yeah, I, I do uh, occasionally get uh, some emails or calls from people that have uh, you know had an opportunity to use them in anger and uh, tell me how they work. And uh, I have yet to have anyone complain. Uh, say there's been an issue. So I'm very, very thankful for that, uh, that, you know, it's doing the job, whatever I'm making is doing the job for them. Uh, and the yeah. Smilodon, actually, I got a really good, interesting uh, phone call on that one. It wasn't in a, in a military situation per se. It was, uh, well, gee, I can't remember if he Marine or Navy, but he was, uh, spending a little time on leave and was in a bar and, uh, as usually happens in a bar, you, you drink too much and the confrontation ensued. And he, uh, he said the guy, uh, came at him with a broken beer bottle and he ducked and, uh, moved away and got, tried to get away from him. And finally, you know, kept warning him, step back, step back, then, you know, just stop. He didn't want to, he kept persisting. So he had a smile on, he drew it couple of moves later he said he had the arm guy's arm in a uh, lock and filleted the arm from the elbow all the way down to the wrist and he said down to the bare bone and he, he said i was totally shocked how fast that happened he goes i didn't think it would cut that quickly wow well there you go that's a that's a real testament you know to how dangerous these things are i mean i i i love i love knives as a hobby and i love uh the bladed martial arts as a hobby, uh, but it's no joke. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it must feel good to know that you, uh, have made, uh, tools that have saved people's lives. Oh, very much. You know, frankly, there aren't too many bad guys out there buying dirt Pinkerton <laughs> knives. You know what I mean? They're, they're getting whatever they want out of the kitchen or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, out of my car because it's been broken <laughs> so many times. <laughs> but uh, they're they're getting what they want that way. They're not buying the Dirk Pinkerton, so it's nice to know that you're making things that are that are helping people stay alive. Yeah, that's that's you know? what I'm really hoping for is that uh, you know the good guys are uh, are caring and and using them when they need to, and that uh, they're working for them. So, what do you see uh, in the future for your your knife designs, your endeavors, uh, your custom work, all of that? I am hoping to one day eventually make a folder. Um, when I get uh, a little bit of space and to get the shop organized a little better, uh, I, I do want to make my own folders. But uh, short term, I'm uh, trying to really focus on the, the knives that seem to be the most popular right now, which currently seem to be the Smilodon and uh, a lot of the reverse grip stuff and some of the smaller uh, things. Um, I do uh, little uh, little pieces called shrapnel. Um, basically those are knives that come from the drops, um, in my shop. Mm. So what I try to do with those are, um, 
I find a piece of metal laying on the floor and I look at that shape and if it's big enough, I make a knife out of it. But the, the whole trick to it is to not change the profile of how it dropped. And so oh, I want to keep cool. it as close to that as possible. And, um, those turn out to be really, really popular. Um, those go in a heart because they're always such an odd shape. They're unique. No two are the same. Uh, and I don't charge a lot for them because they're very small and they're just little keychain kind of knives. Um, uh, but the demand for that is huge. Uh, I take that to the blade show and it's gone in five minutes. So how do people find them? Uh, if they're not at blade show, if I have them, I'll post them on, uh, Instagram. Uh, there's uh, river's edge custom cut or river's edge cutler in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, you know, I'm friends with those guys up there, Brian and Mike. Uh, so I'll send them a lot of, but, uh, when I have some, and then, uh, if I'm lucky and I have the time, which I'm, I don't usually have the time, I'll actually post it on my website. <laughs> um, but uh, they don't usually make it that long. Usually Instagram, uh, they're gone in a heartbeat. So is that how you sell all your knives these days? I mean, I know you can go on your website and see samples of them, but is Instagram your your it's, Yeah, it uh, seems marketplace? to be the primary marketplace right now. Um, it's worked extremely well. Uh, I have a lot of people that, uh, contact me through Instagram and, uh, more, some more traffic there than I do on my website, even though I try and push people to my website and, you know, I've got this knife, buy it on my website, you know, just to justify its existence. Uh, they still mm -hmm. just go through Instagram. So yeah, it's uh, right now that seems to be the primary, primary place. Well, uh, before we wrap, I want to I want to say I've seen some uh, I, I watched a, a video from maybe two years ago and it was at River's Edge Cutlery, I believe. Uh, but you had some crazy one offs. Uh, one of them was based on the Japanese comma. Uh, one of them looked like a um, well, I think you called it the pocket sickle. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. These uh, uh, art, um, agricultural implements turned into pocket tool slash weaponry. Uh, are those one-offs or uh, are those things that you're planning on um, cultivating uh, design-wise and making more of? Or are those kind of things that just strike your fancy, you make them, and then that's that? A lot of it, yeah, some of it is striking my fancy. Sometimes I just get a you know, wild hair and, you know, you got to you gotta take care of that. But uh, like the pocket sickle, I actually like that concept. And I've been trying to work up a, a design because these are all free form when I make them. I don't draw them out. I have no pattern for them. Uh, so I've been trying to come up with a design and get an actual layout done and have them, uh, some cut out and have some made and potentially even have somebody like artisan or somebody pick it up as something that, uh, as a, uh, a cheaper, uh, fixed blade that they could do. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of time. It is, uh, it just, I get, you know, I get a, that what that itch that I got to scratch and I go, I go off and I do some crazy stuff and uh, the pocket sickle was one of them. Uh, definitely. That is one nasty look at, and in the video you're like, I'm just making i uh, I'm just making uh, what did you call it? A field implements into pocket tools. You decide what to do with them. I'm like, I think I know what to do with that. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's, it's, it's your tool. You, you know, you use it how you see fit. <laughs> Exactly. For me, it would be uh, putting it in my case and admiring it, showing it off to friends. That's, yeah, that's. <laughs> I gotta be honest. Like, uh, you know, that's that's what most of them. That's very end up true. Doing. Most of it is uh, is meant to be, you know, looked at. That's how most people view it as a piece of uh, art, uh, and I, I appreciate that. I really do. I I don't uh, I don't view myself as an artist so much as a craftsman. You know, some people see art in my work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, but. Uh, that's not my intent. Well, I, I, I see artistry in your work, I, but uh, the way I define art, it can't be a knife because a knife can do things other than look good and be appreciated for its looks. So, yeah, you, you, you have artistic skill that you're putting into these awesome designs that are uh, doing way much more than just looking good. Uh, Dirk Pinkerton, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and find out a little bit more about the man behind the knives. Thanks thank for you. coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. That's been my pleasure. Follow the Knife Junkie on Instagram at thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram.
All right, Bob, back here on the Knife Junkie podcast interview with Dirk Pinkerton of Pinkerton Knives. And uh, I love his uh, phrase he had on the uh, the website, uh, design with a purpose. You know, he, he's, he sounds like a purpose-driven kind of guy in that interview. Yeah, and actually, it's funny you should say that because that was my main takeaway is that like, though his knives are all very aesthetically pleasing to me and in many ways very on trend, especially in terms of the blade shape and the sizes of uh, a lot of these knives he has coming out with the with the uh, with Kaiser and Artisan. So though aesthetically uh, pleasing and pushing that envelope, he's also very purpose driven. I look at the Nomad, which is. Um, a knife, his his Persian knife that he has. Uh, it's a it's a flipper frame lock, a titanium frame lock flipper from Kaiser, and it's got this beautiful upswept blade, and it really looks kind of like pocket jewelry. But we had a uh, we had an email discussion after the interview, and he was talking about that knife in particular, and how though it looks. Uh, like it has a lot of decorative flourish to it. Every single aspect to it, every facet, literally, uh, has a purpose, has a an ergonomic and a and a purpose driven purpose, <laughs> utility <laughs> purpose. Uh, so I, I it was really uh, interesting to hear that, and uh, I knew it, but uh, having him say that, it's not just a pretty knife. Right. Everything about it has been considered. Right. So, yeah, he seemed to, in the interview, he seemed very uh, deliberate, analytical, you know, a lot yes. of thought behind uh, every little detail of the knife, as you said. I mean, I can yeah. pick that up in the interview when he was talking about the, the different models that he had. So, yeah, very interesting. And uh, not for nothing, but it looks like I might uh, have a Smilodon coming my way at some point. Well, you know, I think uh, selfishly, didn't you start this podcast so that you could buy a knife from everybody that you interviewed? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so people check out the Smilodon, look it up. It's such a cool looking knife. Right. Yeah. All right. Hey, if you're not subscribed to the Knife Junkies newsletter, which we send out occasionally, you can subscribe at thenifejunkie.com slash subscribe. That subscribe page will also enable you to subscribe to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you happen to be catching this on the YouTube channel and you're not subscribed in your favorite podcast app, you can do that at thenifejunkie.com slash subscribe. Or if a friend has recommended this podcast and you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode, which we have two shows every week, this interview show on Sundays and a, uh, a midweek supplemental episode where Bob covers knife news, product drops, other things like that. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. As we normally do, I turn it over to Bob for the final word. All I want to say is everybody keep an eye out for the inversion coming out, the inversion uh, it is a mind bender when you look at it, and uh, it it will surely be a, a very successful knife for Dirk and for Kaiser. Mm, all right. Stay tuned for that. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on episode number 88 of the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim the Knife Newbie Person. Take care until Wednesday. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.